All right. So welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a nice lunch. So we are nearly done with the coupon API. Um, but does anybody remember one thing we discussed earlier about a problem we may run into once we finish authentication, which we did? So how do we create users, or how do we create admins more specifically? We need to have admin privileges in order to do that, right? And so we run into this thing where we're kind of stuck creating the first admin. And so we discussed a few different possibilities on how we would do that. Does anybody remember what we discussed? What are some possibilities? Yeah, so either the first user automatically gets upgraded to being an admin, which was bad, right, because there's a race. Uh, Galen? Yeah, using an init script and init script, which means a script that's run when we initialize the server. So as soon as it boots, boots, it will check. <laughs> It'll check to see if there's already a user that exists, and if not, then it will go ahead and create one. Any other possibilities? We could hard code a user, which is pretty much what we do in the init script. Yeah? Edit to what? Yeah, you could just manually add it to your database. So go in via the command line and just manually stick one in there. And so we decided back when we discussed this last that using an init script would probably be the best way to do it. And so let's implement one. And so what are some things we need to keep in mind when we do this? Can anybody think of a possible algorithm that we'll go about? Any guesses? All right, so where are we going to include the, get the init script? Josh, where would you put it? Where would you put that init script? Yeah, so one possible way would be to put it in the controllers within the users, which would make sense. Um, another possible way would to be to put it within the server itself. That way, when the server starts, the first thing it does is run that init script. And so that's where I chose to put it. Where you put it is up to you. But I'm going to go ahead and open up that coupon API.js and write some stuff in here. So our, at line 22, 23, we have... If we're in dev mode, go ahead and use that logger, which logs any requests to the screen. And I'm going to say, hey, if we're in production mode, else let's run an init script. And so how do we run a separate JavaScript script? Does anybody know how we would do that? We could actually just require another script. What, it, what that does is it runs that script and then imports any of its exports. But if we don't set it to a variable, all it will do is just run that script. So we can go ahead and just do else require um, some init script that we'll write. And so let's just write it in init slash init. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and write an init script within an init folder for a reason you'll see in a second. Yeah. <clears throat> yep, so this will run every time we restart that server if we are in production mode. Yeah, within the script itself, we'll do that. All right, so let's go ahead and write that init script now. 
So what folders or files do I need to create? So I did require init slash init, so I'm going to need an init folder. So I'll go ahead and make the directory called init and cd into it. And I'll need an init.js within here. And so what am I going to do first? I'm just going to console log, hey, we're running the init script. That way, whoever's watching the console will see that it's being run. And then I'm going to go ahead and do this, require dot slash create first admin. So why might I have done this? Any guesses? Yeah. You always have an admin when you boot it up. Yeah, so I'll always have an admin while I boot it up. But my the question that I meant to ask was, why am I requiring a separate script from this script, which is getting required into the main script? A little bit confusing. And it all goes back to like the modularity of how we are organizing everything. And so if you remember NPM, we include a lot of modules. And so we're like, we like in JavaScript and in Node especially to keep everything very modular and to keep each module as small as we can. And so this is a mirroring of that organization where we have a script, and all it does is it creates the first admin. We have a script called init, and all it does is tell, or it, it will call all the other scripts that we write. And it may be the case, and it is the case, that we only have one script to run, which is creating the first admin. But if later on we want to add other scripts that will run, so maybe we want to create an initial coupon, or maybe create an initial super admin or something like that, we're going to, we would add these as separate modules within this init.js. That way we keep all of our logic separated. Does that make sense to everybody, why we would do that? All right, so now that's, that's the end of this script. So now what do we have to do? Yeah, we have to write create first admin. So vim create first admin. And this is where all of our logic is in order to create that first admin. So any ideas on how we're going to do that? Can anybody think of any algorithms? Yeah. So this is within a new folder called init. Yeah. Yeah. So we can rename it uh, create for super admin if we want. All right, and so what are we going to do when we create our first super admin? Any ideas on algorithms, <clears throat> ways we can do this? Within request, then we'll do as request as opposed to the created user. Yeah, so we could we could send we could use that request module to send a request over to our backend that says create our first user, what might be a problem with that approach? So in order to use that endpoint, we'll need a token that says I'm an admin. And so we run into that same problem that we have that we're trying to solve right here. And so we need to bypass all of our routes and go straight to the database. And so how do we do that? How do we interface with our database? Exactly. Yeah, user.save. And so we, we'll do the same thing that we did in our actual user endpoint, but just hard code it into a script. And so we'll probably need Mongoose for that. So let's go ahead and include Mongoose. What else will we probably need? Yeah, our schema. So we'll go ahead and do const user gets the schema that we created.
Anything else we might need? Probably not. All right, and now what should we do? We should probably have some sort of admin that we want to insert. And so we could do something like var admin email, get some hard-coded value. Somebody should stop me and say, hey, Jordan, why are you hard-coding a value here? Why? What else would we do? Is that a hand? Uh, not quite. Something to do with me hard-coding a value directly into a file. Yeah, we should put it into the config, right? So rather than putting it here, let's put it in the config. So let's open the config. Um, if you recently pulled, I already have some stuff in there for you. And so we're going to use those to create the first user. Does everybody have this config file? Did everybody freshly pull it? Yeah. So the question is, what's the purpose of the config file? And so throw back to CS50. Uh, back in CS50, we did some P sets in C. And we would have often logic that depends on some hard-coded values. And so an example of that would be like game of 15. Game of 15 was a 4 by 4 square. You guys all did that one, right? And so we wanted to say, all right, our dimensions are going to be 4 by 4. And so a lot of places in that program, you do a for loop that iterates from 0 to 4. What if we wanted to say play the game of 24 instead, which would be a 5 by 5 board? Most of the logic remains the same, and all we would have to do is change the dimensions of the board, right? But if we wanted to do that, we would have to go and change every single instance of a 4 that we can find in the program, which would be tedious. You might miss one, or you might change a 4 that was meant to be something else. And so instead, what we did is we created something at the top of the file, a global variable, or a hashtag define that said, we're going to define our board size to be 3. And then we use that variable everywhere within the program. That way, if we wanted to change it later, we just change that global variable or the hashtag define, rather than going through and change all of that. And so what we did there is we abstracted away a certain value that became easily changed later. And so that's exactly what we're doing with our config file. Here, we're adding any hard-coded information that we have that might get used in multiple other places in our application. So things like the port that we're running on, or the location of our database, or the secret for our creating tokens. Also, this email that I set up, or a bunch of these providers that you see. And so this, these are some values that we'll use all over our application, maybe one time, maybe zero times, maybe multiple times. But the point is, if we want to then change the value later, we, all we do is change it in this file. We don't have to worry about, hey, where did I use that port variable? Let me go find where I did that and change that. And so we're just abstracting out some hard-coded information so that's easier to change later. All right, so in here we already have an email from name, email from address, email password. And we'll go ahead and use the email from address and email password for the init script. And so what do we have to do? We'll have to require the config file into here. So All right, so one thing we should do first is make sure that our init script runs after we already connect to our database. So on line 17 of our server file, our coupon API.js, we have mongoose.connect to the config.db URL. And then we cannot run our init script until we've already connected to our database. Does everybody see why?
All right, so now we are connected to our database and are ready to start running our scripts. So what, what should we do first? We should first make sure there's already an admin, right? And so let's use our canonical admin from our config file and see if they're already in our database. How do we do that? User.find, where the email is what? Email from address? From, from address, yeah. And then second argument here is always the callback function. And now we, we can't do this line that we probably have in muscle memory, the if error return next error. Why not? Yeah, there's no such thing as next. We're running a separate initialization script, and so there's no callback. There's no next middleware to pass to. So here we would just have to return console.log. There was an error. Maybe we'll just console. Yep, so next is something that's specific to Express, because remember, Express is a chain of middleware, and so by calling next, we invoke the next middleware in the chain. But since this is a one-off script, it's not running as middleware, so there's no next to pass to. And so if there's an error, we can't pass it to any error handlers, we can't pass it to the next middleware, so we'll just go ahead and abort and just console.log that error. Does that answer the question? Awesome. And so now what should my next line be? What, what happens if there are admins, if admins exist? Then we're done, right? This means we don't really have to initialize anything because the user's already in the database. So we can just say, all right, we're done. What happens if the account is not in the database? I'm just going to add this line that says console.log could not find user plus that user. And so now we should go ahead and create that user, right? So we could do var new admin gets, how do we create a new instance of the user? Does everybody remember? New user and pass it some sort of config object. And so we could do email gets config.email from address. We could do hash gets config.email password, I think I called it. What else should we pass? Probably is super admin gets true. And then we also mandated that a company name got passed. So we can pass company name and let's just say HSA. <coughs> now what? Are we done? Can we just return? No, we need to actually write this to our database, right? So we need to do new admin dot save, which takes a single callback whether or not there is an error. If error, what do we do? 
let's just turn console.log error. Otherwise, we're done, right? It worked. So we can go ahead and say console.log created user plus that email address. And then we are actually done. All right, shall we try to run it and see if it works? Is everybody good copying? Anybody want me to wait? So how do we get our app to run in production mode? We need to set the environment to be production. The way to do that is actually to set an environment variable. So export capital node underscore capital env to be production. And that will say we created the environment where node will now run in production mode. Yeah? Do the export variables work there? What do you mean? In the, in the console, the export like bar x equals 1, the x bit within that directory? Um, so question is, can we... What did we actually do when we did an export a variable? And what we did is we set an environment or a bash variable. And so this is an environment or a variable within our console. So if we did echo the variable, it is now within our bash. And if you want to see all of our variables, you can type env. And these are all of your local variables within your terminal. You should see node env in here somewhere, right here. And so now if you run this, it will run the script. So npm run dev. Um, So I got a little ahead of myself and included what we'll be working on later today. So the way to shut up this error is to install node mailer. So npm install dash dash save node mailer. So question, what does the dash dash save do? And that all it does is it also adds whatever you're installing into your package.json. That way you don't have to keep track of those things yourself. All right, so now if we run npm run dev. Oh. Um, hold on, one, well, one second while I fix this. All right, and so now if we run it, we see that our init script actually did run. How do we know it ran? Oh, so down here. So we ran it down here. 
Where? The, I, just, I fixed the stuff just now. Um, so this is when we ran it. So we did running init script, could not find user, and then created the user. And so <laughs> the reason that we put those console logs in there is so you know that the, uh, con that the init script actually ran. Oh, so what I changed was the bug that we fixed earlier today that I reintroduced was uh, this should be get all us get users rather than get all users, which is what I what? Um, if you pulled recently, then yes. Was everybody able to get it running? Did people get their init script to run? Oh, what node? Is it Windows people? What node version are you running? So make sure you used, so you should be on 6.9.2. Yeah. Um, the way to fix that right now is change let to be var. Um, so let is block scoped, meaning if you have an if with curly braces and you declare a let within there, when you get outside the curly braces, that variable no longer exists. So it's scoped as if it were like a variable in C. Was everybody able to get their init script to run? Yeah? Uh, I did dot slash because it was in that same directory. This one? So how do we run the init script? We don't have to worry about running it ourselves because within our, within our server file, we, what we're doing is just like we require a bunch of files up here, which runs them and then exports their module.export, what we did is we did <coughs> require init slash init. And what that does is it runs that file located at dot slash init slash init and if we go check out that file, what that does is it console logs, hey, we're running the script. And then it, it requires a file within that same directory called create first ad, super admin, which is this file, which we have all of our logic within. Um, did you do the export node env gets production? So, within here, what we did is we said, if you're in dev mode, run that logger. If you're in production mode, then run the init script, which means only run the init script when you're in production mode. What we could do is we could say, always run the init script, and then it will always run, whether we're running in production mode or running in development mode. So I guess we can do that. So run the init script is just that. Um, within bash or within here? Bash, no, you don't. Um, did you do export? 
No spaces like that. Um, so this, doing this is synonymous to having this within your config file. And so some things will look at your environment variables, but what we code, we're saying look within our config file. And so this is synonymous to having a config file for your terminal. Right, so why can't we put that into, oh, is that, okay. So why do we have to put the, the environment variable into terminal non -directional? Because the way that Express is set up is that it will specially look for this variable and run slightly differently if it's in production mode versus development mode, as will NPM. Right, but why is it required in the terminal in our code? Why is that? So why don't we have to do this within our code? Yeah. Um, because this app.getEnv is a special um, flag, and what it does is it looks in your terminal for that node end variable and sets it equal to what this is. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Isn't there a way also to change our code, like export the node end the end like variable within our code? Um, so we don't have to like re remember. I don't know if there is. So the question is, can we have our code export node end gets production? Um, Yes, there is. Um, I would say you should never do that because the reason, the whole reason for having this node end variable is to let your code know what environment it's running in, whether it's running on a development server, or whether it's running on your computer, or whether it's running on your production server. And so hard coding that into your code defeats that whole purpose. And so what this flag is, is it allows your code to perform slightly differently depending on depending on what server it's being run on, or depending on where it's being executed. Was everybody able to get their git, or I mean their init script running, or getting errors? Object undefined? So is it line 51? Um, so that means that means uh, what you set your to be your callback is actually just an undefined variable. So go check your variable names to make sure it's actually what you're exporting from the other controller. <laughs> Do people understand the init script in theory? Yeah. So do we have any bugs in our init script? Does somebody say yeah? The fact that I'm asking if there are any bugs kind of implies that I myself have found a bug. Can anybody else find it? So hint, line seven is where the bug is. What is the bug here? So it's an array. So it is an array. And so we're checking the length to see if the length is 1, which is a truthy value. So everything other than a length of 0 would be a truthy value. So if this user exists, then immediately return. What? We could do equals 1, but that would not alleviate our bug. The bug would still be there. So just because this email exists in our database doesn't necessarily mean they're a super admin. And so we'd also have to check to make sure they're a super admin here. I'll let you figure that one out. Other potential bugs? 
what happens if I just wanted to do this? How come it didn't work? So if we wanted to run the script as a standalone script without getting it required into the server, we're also missing that mongoose.connect step. And so does anybody want me to go over how we would connect to it or yeah? All right, so let's, let's make this work even as a standalone script, meaning even if it hasn't yet connected to a database. All right, so if we're running it as a standalone script, when it's done, we'll want to disconnect from that database. And so we'll need to keep a flag called disconnect, is what I called it at least. which is a flag that says, hey, if I'm running as a standalone script, I should disconnect at the end. But if I'm running as part of the init script of the server, I don't need to disconnect because that server is going to use those connections later. And so next we'll want to open a mongoose connection if and only if it doesn't exist. And so if you read through the documentation, then you'll see that there's this thing that's called mongoose.connection.ready state, which tells you if it's ready to connect or not. So we can do if mongoose.connect.ready state is equal to zero, <coughs> then we can say, hey, by the way, So if there was not a connection, open a connection, or say that you're going to open a connection, and then actually open that. So I'm going to steal that line of code that we have from the GDoc, this one, and just paste that directly here. And then we need to remember to close that connection at the end. So that's Yeah, so question, aren't we already running this in our server file? And so we're now modifying this so that we can run it as a standalone script. So just from the command line, we can do node, the script. It will open its own connection and then close when it's done. All right, so we now successfully opened a connection if there wasn't one already. And now we just need to remember to close the connection before we exit. And so we have to check where could we possibly exit. Well, we have a return here, here, and down here. And so now, before every return, we're going we're gonna to need to close that connection. So let's search for them. So there's one here. So we can do mongoose.connection close before we exit we need one here well actually we also need to check only if we want to actually disconnect so if disconnect then do that do that here here and here <coughs> if 
we want to be very verbose, we can also say we can tell the user exactly what we're doing. Everybody understand the logic? Yep, so every time we are going to return, so I just search for return, and then before we returned, I just closed the connection if we had uh, put disconnect to be true. So the script from the Google Doc was that mongoose.connect, and that just was the options that we provided to connect to the server. And you ran in the terminal? Um, I just pasted it here on line 9. <coughs> So I'm just adding console.log so when we run it, we'll see exactly what it's doing. Otherwise, it just does it quietly and we won't know what actually happened. So now let's try to run this as a standalone script. And it worked. So it said, opening Mongo's connection because there wasn't one already. It said, oh, we already found that user, and so we're just going to close the connection. What happens if we wanted to not have that user? Well, first we got to delete it. Deletion's actually closed off without a token, so I'll just do it manually. So what I did is I just manually deleted that user. And so now let's try running our init script with our users gone. And it worked. So it said, opening Mongo's connection, could not find the user, created that user, and then closed the connection. Don't worry about this because we didn't use any promises within. Yeah? Do you access the Mongo from the uh, terminal there? You, you do Mongo .net? Yeah, so if you, want, if you also want to test this on your own, the way to open up the Mongo um, command line is to do mongo dash dash port which specifies what port it's re reading at and then we're running on port 5000 <coughs> so that connects to the mongo shell if you want to remove all of your users you can do db dot users which means open up that users database and then dot remove and then just like when we do mongoose or user.find, we give it some sort of object to query on. We just want to give it the empty object so match everything. Enter and it says we removed one of them. And then exit will exit. Say we want that user back, we can just run our script and then it'll be back. And there our user is. Any questions on init script? Why we'd use it? Why we wouldn't? Cool. I'll go ahead and push my code for you.
So if you want my init script, you can go ahead and pull. Otherwise, yours is fine. Everybody good? Any questions on Nick scripts? What is this picture? <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> Savage. All right. <laughs> so, so, next lecture, adding packages. And so say now, <laughs> Say we now want to add pictures, <laughs> not pictures. Uh. Say we want to add packages to our lecture. Uh. Sorry, Shira. Say we want to add packages to our um, API. We can go ahead and do that. So how do we add packages to an Express server? Well, NPM packages are open source. What does that mean? Lots of people can see the code. Lots of people review the code. Especially, especially the ones that are used very often. So something like Express, all of the source code is online, and so the software engineers who use it, especially the ones who really know what they're doing, will go read through the source code to make sure there are no bugs in the actual source code. And so with however million downloads it has, a lot of eyes have seen it. And so we can generally trust the very popular open source ones just because there are a lot of eyes on that code. Packages are also very easy to install. How do we install a package? NPM install. NPM install that package. How do we then start to use that package in our code? We just require it, right? And so it's very easy to install a package. And so we talked about, like on JavaScript front end, why, Jake, why we might not want to use a JavaScript library, might not want to use a JavaScript framework. It's just because there's a lot of bandwidth going back and forth between your server and the, and the client. But since we're doing this on a back-end server now, we don't really care how much space these libraries take up. We don't care about bandwidth because we're not sending them to any of our clients. They only live on our server. And so how do we find these packages? Well, turn to Google. If you want to know, hey, how do I send mail from a node server? A quick Google search and you'll be able to find it. Also within the NPM registry, which is npmjs.com, they have a list of all of the NPM modules there. And then also you can turn to GitHub. And so how do we start using these packages? What if a lot of them use new cutting edge features like promises? And so we talked a bit about promises a few days ago. We used them quite a bit a few days ago. And there's something that sets them apart from callbacks. And the large benefit is their ability to be truly asynchronous. And so callbacks, if we wanted to do, to do two things at once, we would have to put one in the callback of the other one. But with promises, we have this thing called promise.all, which runs everything simultaneously and only runs your then condition once they all return. So when might this be useful? So what if we have multiple Mongo schemas and an endpoint might need to touch multiple ones at once. So something like in your dorm supplies, maybe you have the item, you need to decrement its inventory, but you also have the user, and you need to add that purchase to that user's um, object. So you could use a promise.all to do that. So it does both of them simultaneously, and then only returns, only runs that then clause once both of them is, have returned. We'll see in a little bit here, why we might use it for the coupon API. And so I can just show you a quick what promise to all does. So is everybody relatively comfortable with promises where you do like fetch this dot then a callback dot then that then's callback dot catch whatever. And so this Promise.all takes a single array. Where you have a couple promises. Maybe you have, we'll just call it P1, P2. Where this might be a fetch, this might also be a fetch. Or this might be a Mongo, mongoose query, this might also be a mongoose query. Then we have our dot then. 
which is usually a function that takes a result. And then what is result? Generally, it's just whatever it returns to you. But now it's an array of this and this. So we could say p1 res gets res bracket 0, p2 res gets res bracket 1. And then we are off to do whatever we were going to do before. So it's pretty much exactly the same as promises, except you can run two at the same time, and then the then clause would only run after both of these have been fulfilled. If either one of them gets rejected, then you hopped straight to the catch. Does everybody see why this might be useful for us? Yeah. So if we did promise, rather than doing dot, promise dot all with these two, if we just had this and then a dot then for that, this and then a dot then for that, they would be asynchronous, and the then calls might then happen at different times. And so say we wanted to do something with the, that uses the return statement of both of them, we would have to do it synchronously, I guess. So we'd have to wait for both of them return. But if we just had p1 dot then, p2 dot then, those dot thens would execute whenever either of them returned to that then clause. And so this allows us to use the return of both of them within the same logic. Does that make sense? All right, so let's see this in action with the next library that we're going to use, which is one to send emails. So let's find an NPM package for sending emails. So how might we go about doing this? I tend to my turn I tend to turn to my friend Google. There we go. So hey Google, sending emails in Node.js. And the first thing that pops up is this thing called Node Mailer. And so this is an NPM package that we can go ahead and install and use to send emails. So why are we going to send emails in our coupon API? Well, you can actually send emails to, you can send emails which turn into text messages. So if you send an email to my phone number at my carriers, what they're listening at, dot whatever, then it will actually set, turn that into a text for my phone. Everybody knows we can do that, right? No, you do. So you can so you can send an email which sending So you can substitute a 10 digit email or a number for the number from each carrier and then do at whatever and it will actually send it a text. Really? <laughs> so I can do this. Yeah, so that's why I needed the carrier when I asked in our coupon. You guys want a demo? <laughs> There's no limit from how many I can send via email, but if somebody's on a limited phone plan, it counts against that as a message. So I could say send to 1805. So eventually, my phone should get a text. I don't know if I have service. Oh, I do. So I got a text that says, it says jhayashi at gmail.com, which was the sender, slash subject, which is the subject, slash subdude, because that's what I sent myself. So if you're feeling lonely and you want to act like you have friends, you can send yourself an email, which will turn into a text. Yeah. 
in this system here. So while you, when you're done playing with that, then we can go ahead and add this functionality to our database, or to our backend. And so, you may have noticed that I stuck something in here called sender, which is a new um, controller. And so you can find this file in your controllers. And what it does is there's something that send all coupons to all users, which will be an endpoint that we write that gets all of our coupons, gets all of our users, and sends all of them, all of the coupons. We have send coupon by ID, which is it will send one coupon to all of our users. And I couldn't really think of a good place to put them in our REST organization, so I just had a slash send, which sends it. <coughs> so let's go ahead and do send coupon by ID. So within here, we'll have access to rec.params.id, which will be the ID of what based on the endpoint. Jeff, what is it? The user or so if we have slash coupon slash ID, yeah, by our rest principles, that should be the ID of the coupon. So let's go ahead and write that. So within here, I have some code already written for you. We already included node mailer. We, are in, we already included the user and coupon and config. We have this thing called a transporter, which we'll get to in, to in a second. And then we have these two helper functions, which I wrote. So one does get provider domain, which it looks like it iterates through the config.providers. And if the provider matches, it'll grab the SMS of that. What the heck does that mean? We can just look at our config file. And so we have a list of providers, which I hard-coded for us with their name, their SMS, and their MMS endpoints, and their long name, which we'll display on the form. And so this helper function called get provider domain will just iterate through this and match up. It'll match against the name and return the SMS endpoint. This function called build email array, we pass it an array of users. And what it does is it iterates through the users and creates an array of a bunch of emails. And so we'll use these helper functions in order to send this coupon to all of our users. <clears throat> is everybody up to date? Do they have this code? All right, so now let's look at what the heck is this var transporter gets whatever, whatever. So if we look into Node Mailer, you can go visit their website at nodemailer.com. And it has some TLDR usage for us, which means, hey, if we wanted to do the bare minimum to send out emails, what do we have to do? Well, we need to include Node Mailer. We need to create a transport, which is basically authenticate me into your email, your email server. And so I did. I created transport. The service is Gmail. And the authentication is what we had in our config. So here's a great example of us using the email from address within here and also within our init script. And supposedly, we will be able to use this transporter later. How do we do that? Well, we do transporter.sendmail, give it some options where the options are who's it from, who's it to, subject, text, and HTML. So the mail info. And then we can do just .sendmail, and it'll go ahead and send all of those. And so now let's write an endpoint that will send the coupon by ID to all of our users. So now we need information from multiple endpoints, right? We need to go fetch the information about the coupon, and we need to go grab all of our users. So what construct may we use to do that asynchronously, and then be able to use both of their return values within a single dot then callback? promise.all, exactly. So exactly what we talked about a little bit earlier. 
So we're going to use a promise to all thing. So promise to all it takes an array. So we've been using mongoose with callbacks thus far, but it turns out mongoose also supports promises. So if we Google this, we see built-in promises. Um, so if you've been getting that error message that says, warning, deprecated, mongoose, m promise thing, the way you fix that is you say, we want to use our own promises library rather than the deprecated ones that mongoose provided. So this thing here, mongoose.promise equals global.promise, we'll shut that up. And so if you look in your coupon api.js, it's already in there. And so it says queries are not promises, but we can use them by doing a dot exec. And so we can go ahead and create a promise out of our query by using something dot find dot exec. And so what two things are we going to query for? Yeah, so all of our users who give us a phone number and the coupon. So let's do all of our users. So user.find. Dot exec creates that into a promise. And then same thing with coupon, right? So coupon dot find. <coughs> then we can say by ID and just give it rec.params.id. And so we actually only want the users who give us a phone number, who had already given us a phone number. And so we can add that with, into our find. So we'll do something like phone exists true. Which means only query for the users whose phone exists. And then do we need to add any special things to our coupon? No, because we, we already have it. And then we can go ahead and do a then. Thens all have functions with a single callback. We can call it whatever we want, results. And then let's go ahead and extract the coupon and the users from that. So we can say var users gets what? Anybody? Allison? How are we going to get the results from the, the user's results? Mm -hmm. So line 16 is a query for all of our users, which returns a promise. Line 17 is a query for all of our, for our coupon by the ID, which is a promise as well. And so they will eventually return and get passed to the then. Yeah, so results bracket zero would be our users. And then for coupon, it's just... Results bracket one. <coughs> all right, so if we've gotten to this point, we now have our user, and we now have all of our users with the phone number, and we now have our coupon. So first thing, if there wasn't actually a coupon, so we do need a little bit of error checking. So if that coupon doesn't exist, then we can go ahead and say, hey, that didn't exist. What about if there are no users? What should we return in that state sense? Yeah, 
Four hundred, but four hundred means that was a bad request. Was there anything wrong with the request that we sent? Not really. So we shouldn't send four hundred there. What may we send instead? Did we successfully send that coupon to all of our users at this point? Some people say no, some people say yes. I would say since we don't have any users, trivially, we've already sent all of our coupons to all of our users. So we did what we wanted to do. So we can do res.sendStatus200, as in we did it, we're done, it worked. So now we can look at node mailers, docs, and go ahead and send that mail. So we're going to want to have a from, which is that config from name. We're going to have a from address, which is that config.from address. We want a to, which is going to be a list of receivers. And so that's that list that we're going to create of all of our users and their phone numbers. We're going to have a subject, some sort of text. We can choose to send HTML, which just prettifies the email. But since this is only going to be a text, we don't need to have any HTML. And then we can go ahead and send that mail. So let's create that mail options. So first, let's create the text that we're going to send. So var um, text, I just will call it, gets, what do we want our text to look like? Let me decide. OK. So maybe we'll have something like config or coupon dot company name plus, meaning it'll say, hey, from this company, it'll say the name of the coupon plus coupon dot name plus maybe a new line, plus maybe if there's a URL, we'll include the URL. So coupon.url. Seems legit to me. All right, and we can go ahead and copy this config that they want us to make. and go ahead and have exactly what we want it to say. So what do we want the sender address to be? Well, it'll probably be the config.mail from name. Is that what I called it? Or email from name. Which is in quotes. So quote open, the email, double quote, quote close, plus a space, and then an opening um, bracket, then config.email from address, plus a closing thingy. So that's our from. Our to, our list of receivers. How are you going to create that list? A little bit tedious, so I already wrote the code for you, but it's just build email array, and we pass it our users. So we can go ahead and do that. Actually, it needs to be a list, a string list. So it can't actually be an array. 
So what we can do is we can do this thing called dot join with a comma, which will stringify that array and join all of its users with a comma in between them. <coughs> Maybe even a comma space. Subject, new coupon, not spam. <laughs> We don't need HTML, and let's have our text be our text that we already created. All right. And then we want to do transporter.sendmail, some mail options, and then give it a callback function. A little bit weird to mix up callback functions and promises. I did a little research and learned that this actually supports promises, so we can go ahead and just do return transport dot send mail. And we pass it those options. And that will return a promise. Call. Transporter.sendmail. No options. So this returns a promise, and so we could have a dot then chain because what it actually returns is some statistics about the mails that got sent, which might be used to have, so we can go, it might be useful to have, so we can go ahead and send that to our users. And so we'll have a function with the mail um, info it returns. And we can go ahead and return that info to whoever requested. So res.json mail info. So you may have noticed we haven't done any error checking yet just because it's kind of built into promises, we can do it all at the end. And so we have a catch function, which takes any errors, and what should we do with those errors? We can just pass it on to our error handler. Any questions on what we did? Does it make sense why we would have to use promise.all there? The alternative would be to use it with callbacks, and so we would have to do, first we would have to do coupon.findById. Within the callback, we would check if there's an error, check if there's a coupon. If there's a coupon, then we have to do user.find by find, and then in that callback, we then check if there are any users. And then we go through all of this, do transporter.sendmail, which takes a callback, and so now we're like in our fourth callback then. Check if there's an error. If not, then res.json, and then we start closing our pyramid of doom. So does that make sense why we would want to do this with promises rather than with um, callbacks? Not only is it nicer looking, it also functions better because we can send the user.find and coupon.find simultaneously. Um, nope, so pretend it takes exactly one second for each of them to happen. If we did callbacks, we would do coupon.find first, which takes one second, then user.find second, which takes another second, and so that will take two seconds to execute. When we, when we do promise.all, they both happen simultaneously, takes one second, and then we start working with the stuff exactly one second later rather than two. How does that work simultaneously with the call stuff? Um, so remember, user.find dispatches over to the database. So this isn't happening, this is happening on the database side, not on our side. So it's truly asynchronous. 
Do you want to see an example doing this exact same thing in callbacks, or are you comfortable envisioning that and working with promises? Yeah, we can go ahead and show it. So, I'll do a split page. All right. So if we were to write the exact same thing, we would start with exports.send coupon by ID, which is a function with rec res next, just like we've done before. And the first thing that we would want to do is search for that coupon. So coupon.find by ID, and we pass it rec.params.id. And it takes a callback, which is a function that takes an error and the coupon. And first thing we have to do is check to see if the error. So if error, return next error. Otherwise, we'll check if there's a coupon. So if there was no coupon, return res.status 404. All right, and so at this point, we know there's a coupon. So we can then query for our users. So we would do users dot find, and we would say find everything where there's a phone. So phone gets exists true. And then that takes a function with an error and all of the users. And so if there's an error, we need to check for it. Otherwise, if there are no users, then we can go ahead and say that was a success. And then what? Now we can start doing our logic. So we would have to do, let's just cut and paste all this stuff. So now we create our text. We create our mail options. And then we do transporter.sendMail, which takes mail options and a function that returns error or info. And then there we have to do if error, return next error. Otherwise, we can do return res.json.info. And we close this one. Then we close that one, then we close that one, then we close that one. So that would be the analogous way to do it with callbacks. And so see how we're starting to create that pyramid of doom, or callback hell it's called? Would there be any match to the callback, like a good callback method? In this case, no. In this case, the promise is better in every single way. And some, sometimes it's better to use callbacks because it's slightly, slightly, slightly faster. But promises is probably the way to go. One, because it looks nicer. Two, because it's more concise. You don't have to check for errors at every single step. Because here we checked error once, twice, three times. And at the bottom, we really we checked for it zero times and just had something that caught all of them. And then, in my opinion, it's easier to read. But did that example help? Any questions on callbacks versus promises? Why we chose to do this one using promises? All right, so go ahead and hop into the groups that you were in earlier today and start adding things like this to your backend. So add a mailer that will send a mail if somebody purchases something. Use promises, promise to all to allow them to purchase something so that decrements the inventory and it also adds to their purchases. So go ahead and start working on building out your back end now. Does anybody have any questions? No? You want that code? All right, I'll go ahead and stop the recording and push.